So, welcome everyone. Glad you could make it after the uh, booze cruise from last night. So, um, of course, our software has no bugs. Um, the hardware we run on has no issues and everything works as it should. So we're all happy campers. However, um, sometimes we do need to find, uh, need to debug something to inspect our system and analyze what's going on. And we've always had tools such as Ktrace, GDB, or uh, even <coughs> good old D DDB um, to help us uh, well, analyze and, and, and debug our problems in those rare cases where we have them. But sometimes we need a tool that allows <laughs> us to dig deeper into the system um, and to give us a more holistic view of what's going on. And D-Trace can be a valuable addition to the list of tools um, we already have. Um, so D-Trace is the dynamic tracing and analysis tool um, originating at Sun, or at least made production ready by Sun. And it's found its way into many other systems. Uh, so it was initially developed for Solaris, um, and of, of course FreeBSD, NetBSD, macOS, and Linux uh, all have an implementation these days. So today I'd like to um, talk to you about the efforts in OpenBSD, and the ongoing efforts, I should say, of um, well, perhaps eventually someday, maybe we'll have D-Trace proper. So first we'll have a, a quick look at D-Trace. Uh, what it is and, and why um, we should care about it. So I'll go into CTF, uh, give an overview of the current state of affairs of CTF and D-Trace in OpenBSD. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, Jasper Lievesa Adriaanse, um, or Jasper for short, been involved with OpenBSD since about 2006. Uh, mostly, well, working in ports and particular GNOME. Um, been playing with Oction and more recently uh, true random number generators uh, for the URNG driver, and of course CTF. So by day I work as a Unix engineer at Snow in the Netherlands, and by night I hide behind these aliases on GitHub and Twitter. So you can stalk me or harass me if you prefer so. So, perhaps uh, a long time from now, in the source tree, still far away, um, but uh, at least the DDB and CTF part have been uh, undergoing for a little over a year now. And was mentioned, the purpose of this talk is to give you a status update of where we are and the efforts that went into it. Of course, brief explanation of D-Trace and CTF itself. So let's start with the uh, end game or end goal first. It's our goal to have D-Trace one way or another, um, but it does require many other pieces to be in place first. Um, an analogy I've been using in the past couple of days to describe <coughs> to people where we are and how far away we are uh, from having D-Trace is picture a puzzle. So we have the corner pieces, we found them, we're working on filling in the edges, and we sort of know what the picture or the puzzle should look like when it's completed by looking at other systems. Um, and we're slowly but surely working on filling in the missing pieces, <coughs> which at this point are still um, a lot. So what is D-Trace really? It's, what well, the name implies, uh, a dynamic tracing framework. Uh, the way it, it works is that it's uh, using minimal impact probes, um, which don't have any effect when D-Trace is not enabled and have a minimal uh, or uh, as small as possible effect when it is in place. So as I mentioned, it was made production ready by Sun in 2003, um, publicly released in, in Solaris a couple of years later, and since it's found its way into macOS um, around 2007, 
FreeBSD, NetBSD, and Linux followed shortly. Uh, there has been an attempt uh, to port DTrace to QNX. However, just like QNX's future, it's sort of unknown. And DTrace is CDDL licensed, which um, may not be an issue for certain systems. However, it's a clear blocker for OpenBSD. So that's the main reason why uh, we cannot simply take the original source code of DTrace <coughs> and of the uh, tools uh, around it, such as the CTF tools. So we cannot import those because of licensing issues. <coughs> so DTrace works with um, providers and probes, which I'll show a bit more about in the next slide. Um, but I also want to mention D, the language D which allows for writing uh, scripts. Of course, the main way of interacting with DTrace is by writing D expressions on the command line. Um, and, and Brandon Gregg wrote the DTrace toolkit, which is a, a very uh, comprehensive set of scripts, um, all using DTrace, but providing top or IO snoop-like functionality. <coughs> So this is one way to, um, a, a very short uh, demonstration of what DTrace looks like. So you call DTrace and you provide it with uh, a probe to use. In this case, uh, we're using a wildcard. So we're using the um, Cisco um, three columns entry um, probe, which means that there's a wildcard in there. Um, so with the Cisco provider, then uh, two uh, namespace separators and an invisible wildcard, a colon, and the entry. So what that means is the, um, what we're doing right here is for every syscall that gets entered, hence the entry probe, we print or we trace the executable name. So for example, as you can see, when we fire up DTrace, uh, you see that's um, entering the IO control syscall twice, and then QMU um, comes along and does uh, uh, some other things. And this sample was um, taken from uh, SmartOS. So as you can see, we're not inspecting a single application here. We're instrumenting the system as a whole. Um, I didn't provide any application to trace, and you can see that dtrace and QMU are running. So another slightly more complex example, but still well, near trivial, um, is to uh, show the number of bytes written per process and um, summing them. And when you quit DTrace, it'll print its summary. And based on this, you can uh, well, analyze your system further, create some fancy graphs. Um, and these were taken from uh, Brandon's uh, dtrace1liners.txt which if you don't know it, it's a, a small treasure trove of neat one-liners such as this one. So why should you care about DTrace? If you know DTrace and if you've used it, um, you probably consider it a, a valuable and, and very handy tool. But if you don't, um, why should you well, uh, be interested and perhaps to get involved in the effort in OpenBSD? So we have a number of tools, Truss, Ktrace, Strace, um, and Ltrace, of which the latter two we have on OpenBSD already. Um, but they're syscall tracers, uh, or, or only for tracing user land. And while these tools certainly have their application, um, they may give you a, a too narrow uh, view of, of the system. Um, and DTrace also addre addresses the observability problem. So what that means is when you inspect something or observe something, the thing you're observing is affected by you looking at it. For example, uh, if you're K-tracing an application, it may behave differently from when it's running uh, un-K-traced, which is quite uh, the, the opposite of what you're doing since you're observing 
well, bad behavior, for example, and you want to see why that's happening, and you're case tracing it, and it may end up doing something else or behaving slightly different ways than uh, um, what it's doing otherwise. And D-Trace does not um, exhibit this behavior. And also, D-Trace allows for very, very fine-grained um, inspection, albeit short-term. Um, you wouldn't want to write your monitoring scripts or long-term um, analysis using D-Trace. Um, there are more appropriate tools for that since it's more for short-term inspection and, and debugging and analysis. And speaking of inspection, um, you've probably all seen the uh, shouting in the data center video. Um, if not, I urge you to look it up on YouTube. It's um, a prime example of, of uh, how to use or abuse um, D-Trace to observe what's going on in your system. And of course, uh, with uh, a more complete tool chest um, of tools, uh, you don't need printf debugging anymore, or, well, um, let's not overstate the case, you, less at least. So, how does D-Trace actually work? So there are a number of providers, um, for example, the Cisco provider that I showed earlier, um, there's the IO uh, provider, the SysInfo, but also FBT, that's the Function Boundary Tracing provider. Of these, um, FBT will be the first uh, targeted provider in OpenBSD. So providers provide uh, probes. Um, we saw the Cisco entry probe earlier um, using the wildcard and here where, uh, for example, the Cisco exec VE entry probe is just for inspecting the exec VE Cisco. So the FPT probe um, works by patching the function boundaries. So as soon as you uh, are about to execute a function, the function prolog um, uh, will be dynamically altered or, or patched. Um, it saves the original instruction you are about to execute. It then runs the probe, which does whatever it needs to do. And when the probe is done um, running, it'll emulate the original instruction you were about to execute when you entered the function. So currently, we do have uh, code for this in OpenBSD already. Uh, it was committed by uh, Martin um, during or shortly before the general hackathon in, in Cambridge. Um, although right now it's, it's uh, hidden under the DDB prof uh, kernel compile time option. Um, but it's the first real um, uh, code we have for, for tracing or probing. So when a function uh, is about to return, um, the last uh, step would be to execute the probe um, if it needs to do that. Um, and when the probe is done processing, it'll uh, emulate the last instruction of the function and the function itself returns normally. So from an outside point of view, nothing happened. Um, the function still did what it needed to do. It just got uh, its uh, prologue and, and epilogue uh, altered. So one key thing with D-Trace compared to other tools is that um, it saves its results in, in per CPU buffers and it doesn't um, directly export these back into userland. So you're not running into uh, the top problem. So if you're running top on a system with a lot of processes running, you'll see that top itself will be uh, one of the uh, processes consuming most CPU time. That's because it's continuously gathering the information and directly um, providing it back to you. Whereas with uh, D-Trace, it'll, by default, on one second intervals, it'll, well, it'll collect the data and at the given interval, it'll export it back to userland. So you're not continuously um, impacting the 
application or system you're tracing with the tool that is tracing it and they're playing uh, or they're, they're battling for CPU time. So that's a, a, a key uh, or feature of D-Trace. Of course, D-Trace needs to know about what functions are, which symbols are available and, and their types. And that's where CTF comes into play. No, not this CTF. This one, the compact type format. So CTF can be considered a compacted notation of labels, uh, functions, and um, all the other types that it supports. This is the full list. Um, it's generally, though in, in practice, basically always uh, compressed uh, with Zlib. And there are two versions of CTF available, um, but within OpenBSD we only target right now the uh, version 2, the latest version. Version 1 isn't really in active use anymore, so there's no reason why we should develop our tools to use that. On Solaris, um, it, CTF is extracted from steps whereas on, on other systems it's using Dwarf. Um, so Dwarf is generated by the compiler. When you compile your source code with the minus G option to generate the debug symbols, um, the compiler will keep track of everything that uh, um, might be useful for future debugging uh, and saves it into several um, <coughs> sections in the ELF object file. However, because uh, Dwarf is so um, well, huge, uh, it's not feasible to distribute kernels um, that always have this extra information. At. So for example, kernel built with uh, all the debug options, um, I'm sorry, all the debug information stored in it is about four times bigger with all the Dwarf parts compared to um, just having CTF. Um, back on August, when we enabled including CTF in, in all the kernels, um, the growth was about 1 to 2 meg. Uh, in, that's including the natural growth that just happens during a hackathon. So the CTF data gets stored into the uh, ELF object file as well. Um, it can be distributed as a separate uh, binary uh, data file, uh, however, in, in, in practice it's always stored in the um, standard .sunwctf section. So when you look at a, a kernel of OpenBSD these days, you'll see that it does have this particular section, which means that it does have all the CTF data of all the symbols, functions, variables, strings, you name it, it's in there. So. It can be considered a, uh, a subset of Dwarf, um, but in reality it's more the, the extracted uh, form of whatever is relevant for D-Trace or CTF or, uh, in our case right now, DDB. Dwarf also um, supports many other languages than what we care about in our kernel. Uh, we're we don't care about Pascal or Modula or C++ or whatever. CTF is only concerned with uh, C, uh, pure, simple C, no assembler at that either. <coughs> so Dwarf also contains information on line numbers uh, to be able to map uh, your code into line numbers and file information. That is not part of CTF. However, it is information we um, are quite interested in, in providing. So right now for a developer to extract that information, uh, they have to be running uh, a, a kernel which contains all the debug information. Um, however, we generally, well, well, we don't recommend users running this kernel. So when they do run into a crash, uh, we have to provide them with this kernel so they can 
re-trigger the crash, uh, get the relevant information, and it would be so much simpler if we could also save this information in some way. Uh, not part of CTF, but it's something that uh, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, Dwarf uh, provides. So here's an example of a CTF dump. It's one of our own uh, CTF tools. So running this on the, uh, the BSD kernel just shows the header uh, with the CTF um, uh, magic number, the version encoded, and further information that's relevant to parsing tools um, of, of this fairly simple and structured format. It's not like Dwarf where you have um, your a compilation unit, your, uh, your debugging information entry, and, and all sorts of extra tags and, and, um, and, and fields that you need to parse in order to get whatever is relevant. So for Dwarf, the relevant uh, information is stored primarily in two sections, uh, the info, debug info and debug uh, abbreviation uh, section, abbreviated to EPREF. So within the compilation unit, um, a die is generated for every variable, type, uh, function, etc. And these uh, dies themselves can be uh, tagged with uh, whatever is applicable to this, um, this die. So it can be tagged as a variable or um, a, a pointer, um, as well as attributes relevant to it. And because dies uh, can be nested, it creates a tree-like structure that uh, tools like a Dwarf Dump uh, are able to traverse and uh, dump a representation of the elf, of, sorry, the dwarf information. So this is a, um, um, some output of Dwarf Dump with all the um, information it knows about this object file. And most of it is quite relevant to a debugger, but not for um, uh, CTF. Quickly going back. So the dwarf um, code that gets generated on OpenBSD right now is dwarf2. Um, in newer versions of dwarf have been released in, in over recent years. Uh, so for example, uh, version 3 uh, added support for C++, uh, or better support for C++. Fortran 90 allocatable data uh, uh, version 4 came with better compression, which is interesting, but also support for C++ 10, which, well, we have no use for in, in our kernel. Um, version, luckily. Version 5 was released uh, earlier this day, uh, this year, sorry, uh, standardized actually. Um, and came with many other improvements, such as w way better compression still, faster lookups, better annotations uh, and descriptions. However, um, the compiler we have right now doesn't fully emit Dwarf 5, um, but it may be at, at one point interesting to move further along uh, with what our tools can use, since they're currently still limited to version 2. So, CTF tools. It's great to have uh, an object file which contains the uh, dwarf information, but in order to well, make something useful out of it, to, to turn it into CTF, we need a number of tools. So Solaris developed um, the CTF tools package which contains CTF convert, merge, and dump. However, they're CDDL licensed. Um, so there was a a blocker for us to move forward with CTF since we couldn't import it into our tree. Back in uh, 2016, we did import it into ports where we're a bit more lenient uh, when it comes to licensing. And it's using the libdwarf and libelf uh, libraries, which we don't have in base either. And it was quite the um, 
effort to find the right combination of, of uh, libelf or not using libelf uh, to port the Solaris specific data structures to OpenBSD, which applies uh, uh, specifically to CTF merge. At some point, uh, we may also want to use uh, libctf uh, if we have enough consumers in the base system. Uh, right now, we only have a very small number, uh, but as its usage increases, we could also distribute uh, that as part of the base system. It is part of uh, other operating systems, um, on the other hand. So having the um, CDDL licensed CTF tools and ports was uh, a great uh, kickstarter for us to move forward. Not worry about this part of, of the problem, but actually move forward on uh, uh, using the CTF data. So MPI um, set out to rewriting, rather uh, creating a new implementation under a uh, more liberal license that it is fit for inclusion in the OpenBSD base system. So we ended up with CTFConf, which has well, uh, functionality uh, similar or equivalent to CTFConvert. Uh, we dropped CTF merge. Um, I'll tell you why in a bit. We have CTF dump, uh, which um, is a, a visual representation of the CTF data, which is a, a very helpful tool in verifying that uh, CTFConf actually works and, and generates what we expect it to. And then we have CTF strip, and this is a, a really nice trick. Um, so our kernels now get built with minus G by default, so they generate all the dwarf data. And then we strip them, but we're not using the regular strip. We're using CTF strip, which does CTF convert on the object file. And if that fails, it'll fall back to plain strip, which removes all the dwarf data, and we end up with a regular kernel, no CTF. However, if CTF convert worked it wrote out the CTF data into a separate file, which we then use opscopy to insert back into the object file. And that's basically what CTF merge uh, does. It takes all the object files and merges all of their CTF data into a single uh, representation, which then gets inserted into the uh, final object file. That's quite a complex process, the merging itself, but also to insert the, the, um, the data into the object file. And we have opscopy in, in base, so why not make a small little shortcut and, and use what's there already? Maybe at some point um, we can add more smarts to CTF strip, um, but then we basically end up implementing large parts of opscopy in CTF strip. So um, yeah, why, why go there? Um, so that said, uh, we do have CTF data available for all, all our platforms uh, right now. We have uh, some support for it in DDB, which allows all the platforms to make use of this. Um, there are some, some portability um, um, or tasks uh, related to portability in other parts of this effort, but CTF is available for all our <coughs> platforms and all our kernels. <coughs> so this is a, a quick example of running CTF dump on a kernel from a couple of weeks ago, uh, displaying the strings available um, in the, the object file, or the kernel in this case. So the first column are the indices, which um, are referred to uh, from other parts of the, the CTF data, as we can see right here, for example, for the types. <coughs> so in this representation, um, we can see that uh, the type integer uh, has index 12. Its encoding is signed 
um, and the others. It's, it's a long list, so I just snipped it for brevity. But here we can see how it's used. So for example, the dbNumArgs function, which is used by the trace command from DDB to look up the number of arguments that a function has. Um, so its index is 4009, and it returns 12. The 12 refers back to the, uh, let's my cursor. Yeah, so the 12 up here refers back to the uh, 12 up there. So we know that dbNumArgs returns an integer, which in this case is the number of arguments. We can also see that uh, its arguments are of these types, which um, is a pointer, which refers to a struct. So we know that the first argument of dbNumArgs is a, a struct, a uh, call frame struct. And we can defer the rest um, based on what else is there. So this is also an, an interesting way of, of parsing all your, uh, your functions and, and mapping their uh, types and their arguments. So DDB. DDB is the in-kernel debugger uh, of well, all BSDs. And it was actually the first consumer of CTF data. So back at the, the hackathon in 2016, uh, we started working on CTF and we needed a way to verify that the work we were doing was valid and would actually lead to somewhere. And DDB seemed like the obvious starting point, which for me was a, a very fun and, and challenging uh, project during the hackathon to dive into the bootloader uh, in order to load the CTF data, um, as well as an adventure into DDB. Um, so from within DDB, we can inspect the CTF data of the currently running kernel. So when the kernel gets loaded by the bootloader, the uh, .sunw CTF data gets loaded and DDB knows where it's loaded at, and when required, it, uh, it, it's using that data, for example, for trace. So trace on AMD64 and i386 at the time, it showed you the function names, but it couldn't figure out how many arguments the functions had. Other platforms such as Spark64 did have, uh, well, architectural advantages, and they could figure it out, um, but AMD 64i36 couldn't. Um, later, the pprint uh, commando uh, or command um, became CTF aware, and most recently, the show struct uh, command as well. So this is what trace looked like in DDB before having CTF. Um, so as you can see, it has no idea of the number of arguments. And with DDB, uh, yeah, so DB enter still doesn't have any, but the others are properly filled in. So that was the first validation of, wow, so it's actually working uh, what we're producing, even though it's with the original CTF tools, but still the way we're integrating it into our kernel uh, does work. So pretty printing um, and CPUs or pretty printing in general is using the CTF data in order to figure out how to represent the kernel uh, data as something human readable and defer the types from it. So as you can see, uh, we're printing the DB uh, CTF uh, variable and right here we have the uh, CTF header. So using um, the show struct command, as we know that it's a struct, we can also uh, print that and see everything that's contained in it. So this is the uh, CTF header data of the kernel that's actually running um, right now or at the time.
So where are we at right now? The dynamic profiling part uh, from MPI was committed during the uh, 2016 general hackathon and at that time we really made some great efforts into getting started and figuring out all the components needed, at least CTF-wise. So we imported the original tools into ports. Um, they're still there at the moment, even though we have our own uh, free tools uh, in the base system, but they still serve as a useful reference implementation. And at that hackathon, the origi original uh, DDB code for CTF was committed as well. And then about a year later, um, the tools were imported into base um, and we actually built CTF enabled kernels by default. So this was a, a huge um, step in, in moving forward and getting CTF to the people as it were. So sometime after the hackathon actually, uh, one of our developers, DOG, committed code to um, remove the old DDB struct kernel compile time option and have show struct use CTF. So that was another um, way of, of moving forward and um, validating the efforts. And as you can see, the hackathons have been tremendously important in, in the development of well, not only CTF, but of OpenBSD in general. Um, so, well, they're sponsored by the OpenBSD Foundation, but essentially funded by you, so keep them coming. <laughs> Of course, there's still a lot more work to be done. Uh, for example, we could make an effort in catching up on modern or more recent uh, dwarf versions. We could cut out ctf-conf and see if the compiler uh, could actually be made to work for us, since it already knows all the, uh, the, the types and everything that has to go into a dwarf. Why not? make an intermediate step and uh, generate CTF right away. Of course, there are some portability issues to be addressed still. Um, so for example, the dynamic profiling part is only for MD64 i36 at the moment. Um, and we can extend the uh, usage of CTF for trace into other uh, architectures as well, because most of them have been relying on their internal um, uh, resolving of the number of arguments, um, but why not make use of CTF since it's there? And of course, eventually, uh, uh, we may have D-Trace. It's still long ways down the road, but um, we're making an effort and uh, getting the word out to people and getting people interested and involved. That'll really help to get this completed. So to recap, um, we have our own ISC licensed CTF toolchain in base. Um, all our kernels are built with CTF data and properly inspectable through DDB. Still a long way to go, but we're making good progress. Of course, you can help. So I'd like to thank MPI for well, all his hard work at getting us uh, started writing the tools and being, uh, well, mental support. Of course, the Urbisi Foundation for well, inviting me here and Snow for uh, having given me the time to attend this year's conference. Well, it's, it's not 40 minutes. Um, it's, it's part of the build process. So it's something that users uh, don't see or, or don't notice a, a delay when they boot a kernel. Um, it, on a fast AMD 64 machine like this laptop, it, it takes, uh, I don't know, like, like it, um, I've actually not verified or tested how long CTF strip takes on well, uh, ARM32 or something 
uh, less fast, uh, but it's probably several minutes and not 40. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and um, I, th I think we should uh, spend the time as well to look at other architectures and, and see the impact there and, and extend and improve on those as well. Yep. Yeah, so um, with the uh, load bits, uh, ELF flag, I believe, uh, that data gets also, the CTF data also gets written out to your uh, core file. And then uh, you can uh, do post-mortem analysis on, on your, uh, your user land binary, at least. Um, for now, our effort is mainly focused towards the kernel. Um, but yeah, it, it will be uh, well, quite helpful to do post-mortem analysis and debugging eventually. Thank you.